Amen. Bring up that first side there real quick. How many of you would drink out of a water fountain that looked like that? No. Raise your hand. In the middle of the desert. Okay. Okay. You know, we all have vessels in our house. Y'all know we don't use that term vessel a whole lot. But we all have vessels in our house. There are vessels used for different purposes. There are vessels um, what are traditionally used for toilets. There are vessels that are used for drinking out of. Vessels are used for preparing things. Vessels are used for storing things. And they all have different purposes. <coughs> they all have different purposes. You know, we have some vessels that are made for honorable things, some vessels made for dishonorable things. But you know, one of the things that are, you don't really want to store your things used for dishonorable purposes or things stored for honorable purposes. Now, before the day of um, in-house plumbing, every house had something that was called a bedpan. A bedpan, that's, that, that's what, when it was snowy outside, cold or rainy or in the middle of the night, you used a bedpan instead of the outhouse. But no one would ever store the bedpan with the kitchen glasses, would they? No, there were two different things. You kept them apart from each other. And Paul talks to us a little bit about that. We're going to look at a scripture that he talks to us about that because I want to talk about different vessels this morning. You know, a couple years ago, I was, I was at my in-law's house, and we were having a prayer meeting. We do that a lot at my in-law's house. We were having a prayer meeting, and I went to go to the, the pantry to get the anointing oil. And my mother-in-law has one of the biggest pantries I've ever seen in the house. And, and I go in, and I'm looking all over, and I can't find the anointing oil. Or just the oil. I was just going to get oil to anoint with. So I go to them, and they're all praying in the family room. I'm kind of like peeking through the cabinets. And everywhere I look, she's got glassware. She's got dishes. My mother-in-law is a dish fanatic. Her entire pantry, all dishes. Until finally I said, I had to ask, where is it? She goes, look behind the door. And I open, I pull the door to the pantry, like, you get to step in, shut the door, and there was all the food smushed up over here because all the food space was all glass one. Because my mother-in-law loves dishes. She's got dishes for Thanksgiving. She's got dishes for Christmas. She's got dishes for all kinds of occasions. She's got dishes for everyday wear, and they're all very special to her, and she displays them. I mean, if you look at her pantry, you think you're in a museum of glassware because she loves dishes. She's bought dishes for all of her daughters. And she's giving dishes to all of them. She goes out and she finds them. And she gives them whole sets of dishes because she's all into setting a fancy table. Are any of your wives like that, guys? A few of your wives, maybe? They're all into that. Well, I remember, you know, she's going to keep her stuff all separate from everything else. And with that in mind, I'm thinking of that's how my wife kind of grew up. My son came home after uh, come home, came home to visit with his wife. And when they would come to visit in Arizona, they always brought two things with them. Zoe and Zeus. Zoe and Zeus are 80-pound pit bulls. Okay? And, uh, and if you, you think that... You just try having two 80-pound pit bulls visiting your house. They're big dogs, and they... they, they oh, should they sell a little bit? And they, and they drool. I mean, they just... I mean, they shake their head, and it flies everywhere. And I remember him coming in one time and going, Dad, I need a water dish for the dogs. Do you have a dish I can use? And in my head, I'm thinking... You mean, do I have a dish I can throw away? Because if I let the dogs use this dish, your mother will never allow the dish to be used in the house again. I don't care how many times it's sanitized. I don't care how many times you send it through the dishwasher. It's done for. Because in our house, things for animals are separate than things for people. In fact, lately I've had to, because of our dog and puppies and special food, I've had to wash out the dish constantly. And stuff. And my wife's like, is the sink clean here first? You know, just make sure it's clean. Because vessels that are set apart for specific uses have higher honor. They have other purposes. This is kind of the intent Paul was getting at when he writes this in 2 Timothy 2, 19 to 22. 2 Timothy 2, 19 to 22. He says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. 
Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. There are vessels, he says, vessels for honor, for dishonor. There are different vessels for different purposes. Some are set apart for different honors. When you do anything in the kingdom of God, maybe, the, maybe what you do to serve the Lord seems more servant-like, more humble. But it doesn't matter if what you're doing for the Lord is humble or if it's considered to be noble or, or in front of people. No matter what we do for the Lord, it's considered an honorable thing. And how many of you are aware today that God wants those vessels that are used for His purpose to be kept clean? It's the first thing I want to talk about. God wants vessels used for His purpose to be kept clean. How many want to, uh, again, who would store a bedpan next to a, a table glass? We wouldn't really do that. It wouldn't seem very sanitary or very clean. In the same way, God wants us to be set apart from those vessels that are used for worldly things. He wants us to be set apart from them because anything we do for Him is considered honorable. 1 Peter 1.16 says this. It's a quote, quoting the word of God coming to the people of Israel. It says, be holy, for I am holy. Would you say that with me? Be holy, for I am holy. The word holy means set apart. Kept separate from. Not allowed to touch that which is unclean. That which is dirty. That which is unsanctified. That's how God looks at you and me today. Because as I look out in this room, I think I look out at a group of people that are probably, just about all of us, if not all of us, have given our hearts to Jesus. And God expects us, as ones who have given our heart to the Lord, He wants us to be set apart now. Because once He saves us, He wants to use us for His glory, for His honor. And just as he was talking to Timothy, you see, Timothy, there were these people in the church, and they were teaching all kinds of false doctrines, they were creating division, they were causing bad attitudes, and he wanted the people in the church to begin separating themselves from these bad people because they were bringing people down, they were leading them to places of being immoral and sinning, trying to tell them that it was okay, they had false doctrines, telling people it's okay to do the things that are still in the world. And he wanted them to realize, you need to be set apart. You know, if I look at the modern church today... If I look at the church in America today, we've stopped preaching holiness. We've stopped preaching what it is to live right before God, to live righteously before the Lord. Your righteousness can't save you. It's by grace that you're saved. If you've been here on Wednesday nights, we've been talking about that in depth in Romans. Your righteousness can't save you. But once you're saved and God makes you righteous, He wants you to be set apart from the things of this world. Why? Because He wants to be able to use you. And those vessels of honor in His house, you see, we're no longer in the house of the world anymore. But when we're saved, Jesus makes us His children. He calls us into His house. He adopts us as His own. So we come into the house of God. We come into the house of the Lord. We're in His family. And He wants us as vessels in His household to be set apart for His honor and His glory. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. Are you paying attention this morning? Yeah, Yeah, that you're so quiet. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and he names three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Okay, let's talk about lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. Lust of the flesh is when we are out and about fulfilling whatever desire our body tells us to crave. Food, drugs, alcohol, anything that sexual um, encounters. Our flesh cries out for things that it sometimes wants, likes, craves, looks for. I'm not talking the balance of moderation, eating, and other things. I'm not talking about giving ourselves to, to, to excessiveness and things. Our bodies will often cry out. Our flesh lusts for things. Our eyes lust for things. Fancy cars, fancy houses, lots of money. Great. And there's nothing wrong with a good vacation. There's nothing wrong with a decent house. I'm not talking about that. But if we're drawn to where we're consumed with everything that we do, to just have more and more and more. How many of you can have more stuff and still not be happy? 
You can more stuff and still not be happy. You know, I, I got to be honest with you. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there. I'm, I'm going to, as I say in South, I'm going to just set this out there and let it be there, okay? This week on Facebook, the world goes crazy about, about Prince Diamond. I'm like, oh, seriously? The man had the most immoral music. He couldn't make up his mind if he wanted women or men. He didn't know what he was doing. He had all this money, all this fame, and he still had the drug to try to make himself happy, and he dies of a drug overdose. And then people start posting Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston and, and Prince, you know, the king, the queen, and the prince have died. And they keep going, people, they all died of drug overdoses. They all had fame and fortune and wealth, and none of it made them happy. As a Christian, the last thing I want to do is elevate any of that. Because I'm like going, man, what a loss that is. You know, it's like you can have a talent. And some of them, like Whitney Houston, she had a God-given talent. She started off in the AG church. Somebody got her singing for Jesus. But then she took her to the world. She, she had to have what the world had to offer. The lust of her eyes wanted the things that the world had to offer. It drew her away until it finally destroyed her. We shouldn't be glorifying that. You know what I'm saying? But when we look at those things and we look at lives like that, you can have more of what this world has, but it will not fulfill you. But when you have Jesus, it's time to say, hey, I'm going to be set apart for the things of God. I'm going to take my talents that I once used for the world. I'm going to use them for Jesus. I'm going to use them for God. And then there's the pride of life. Power, position. Wanting different things. I'm, I'm not, that wasn't the, the, you know, if you like Prince and Whitney, you know, Whitney had a gorgeous voice. You know, if you like, well, that, that's, that's violence between you. But I'm just saying, I just look and see how far we've come. I watch people writing on Facebook, you know, oh, when we get to heaven, we're going to jam together. I'm thinking, Prince is not in heaven. <laughs> First of all, he was a member of a cult. He's not there. We don't all get to heaven unless we're saved. Unless we're have the righteousness of Christ change our lives. When will we stop as a church deceiving ourselves and deceiving other people and start realizing that when we give our lives to Jesus, He calls us to be holy. Now that doesn't mean we have to become legalistic, but it means that we need to have lives with purity. We need to let the things of the world pass away from our lives and pursue the will of God and the things that God wants us to do. He set us apart to be holy like He's holy. Not to get as much of the world as we can. I don't get it. People get saved and then they want to still just be like they were before they were saved. When you give your heart to Jesus, He wants to draw you into the life He has for you. It's a better life. It's a better life. Amen. When you're before Jesus, you're facing the world. You're full of sin. When salvation, repentance means, man, my life has been wrong. I've been doing it wrong. Jesus, forgive me my sins. I can't change myself, but God, you can change me. Please forgive me. And he says, I forgive you. And he turns you around. And he says, I've made you righteous. Now he wants you to face towards heaven, to face towards the things of God. And he wants you to move in that direction. But this is what, this is how, this is how people get saved these days. We're riding the fence. We're riding the fence. But Paul says, hey, he said, come on. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Listen to those words. These aren't mine. This is the word of God. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. That's eternal life. You abide forever. Ephesians 1, 4 to 5. He says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. That means God wants us to pursue purity and righteousness with our life. Purity and righteousness with our speech, with our behaviors, with the places that we hang out, with the people that we hang out with. And I'm not saying that, that we don't still, that we can't still be friends with the lost. If we're not friends with the lost, how are they going to come to Jesus? But you know, we're supposed to still be in this world, impacting this world, but we're not supposed to be of this world. Do you get what I'm saying? You still, we still have to love the lost. We still have to, if we don't connect with our friends who didn't know Jesus or our family members, that would be wrong. But to be Connected with them doesn't mean to be participating of all the things of the world with them. Do you get what I'm saying? Hmm? Maybe. You might not like what I'm saying, but do you get what I'm saying? 
All you have to do is look in the letters that Paul wrote to the church, the words inspired by God to speak to man. And it talks about the revelry. It talks about the sexual immorality. It talks about the drunkenness. It talks about greed. It talks about sex outside of marriage. Whether it's with a man or a woman or whether you want to dress like a woman or a man. The whole debate that's out there. I can't even believe that our society has come to that. It talks about filthy talking and anger and bitterness and violence. These are dishonorable things. And God wants us to be set apart. 1 Peter 2, 9-10. This, this is what it says. It says, you are a chosen generation. You realize that? You're a chosen generation. God chose you. He set you apart. A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. That you may be proclaimed the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. What did He call us? Out. out. Say it. Come on. What did He call us? He called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Man, I got to tell you, it's time that the church starts rising up. You know what? This world is going to get worse and worse and worse. Our society, our president has declared now that there won't be a national day of prayer because he's afraid of offending people. I think he offended half the nation. There's not going to be a national day of prayer because he's afraid of offending people. Our society, the persecution is coming out of the church. And let me tell you, church, if we're not the church, if we're not set apart, we're going to just slip away and just be just like the world. We've become so close to being just like everybody else that people can't see the difference in us. But God is looking for vessels that are useful for the master. That's the second thing I want to talk about. Vessels that are useful for the master. How many know God wants to use you? Amen. Amen? Say, God wants to use me. Now say it like you mean it. God wants to use me. Now say it so I can hear it because I can't. God, God wants to use me. God wants to use each of us. He desires us. No one is exempt from God's desire to use us. But here's my question. Are we offering leftovers? Are we offering leftovers? Let me explain that. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and you were like eating soup or something, you know, thinking which was really good? And then you kind of get down in it, and there's this big piece of food crud stuck on the side of the dish. <laughs> I remember a few years back, I, was, I came, they brought me a cup of coffee, and so that was when I still drank regular coffee. And, so, and, 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 I was, and I was stirring it, and I took it out, and my spoon had this big piece of crud on it. And I'm like, oh. And I'm like, and I kind of just went like this to the waitress, and she's like, oh, I'm sorry, she brought me a new cup of coffee. Thankfully, I didn't even have to ask for it. Because there were somebody else's leftovers on my utensil. Yeah, you're all kind of like gagging a little bit in your throat. You know what I'm talking about? It's disgusting. But that's what happens when we go to offer the world this amazing, amazing thing in Jesus. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste the delicacies of the goodness of God. And then our life has someone else's, has the world's leftovers stuck on our utensils like a big piece of crud stuck on a, on a plate or a spoon. It's gross, isn't it? But that's sometimes what the world is finding from the church. They're not seeing a pure church. They're not seeing a bride without a spot or wrinkle. Interesting. We were at, uh, at Life Group the other night. Um, we went to the one with Manny and Colleen because it was close to our house. And uh, we were over there and, and we were talking about how sometimes the world doesn't find us attractive. And yet though the world, and, but people looking for Christ do find us attractive, but they don't find us always attractive because... Because we're not stuck with the same crud that they're stuck with. And sometimes it's just jealousy. Sometimes it's, it's like going, you need to look like us. I don't want to have the crud of the world hanging on me. When the crud of the world is hanging on us, our usefulness for God is less. Because all of a sudden not everybody wants to use us. Not everybody wants to partake of what we might be offering. I think that's what's going on with Christianity these days. I know that people get very critical of church who, who preaches right living. You know the thing is, you can have right living without being a judgmental church. Do you know what I'm saying? What happened to us being able to live right and live pure lives and not be judgmental of those who have not found Jesus? I don't expect the world to live like me. They're not saved. I'm not going to judge them for where they're at. I understand when people come in to find Jesus that they're on a journey and they're not always at the same place that I'm at. 
And so, so we've got to love them into that place. We have to teach them how to scrape the crud off of the world off their lives and move forward with what God wants to do in their lives. But what the church is, what the world sees and gets upset at is when they see Christians who have the crud of the world, they have the attitudes of the world, they have the judgmentalness of the world, they have kind of bad behavior, and all those other things. They see all that crud on our lives, and yet they're saying that this is something delicious. We need to get rid of it all so we can be useful for the master. Are we being used by God? You know there are a lot of Christians who choose not to be used by God because they still want to leave some of that crud. I kind of like the crud on my spoon. You don't like it when I make it sound like that, do you? I kind of like the crustiness of the world sitting on me. Is that why we stay in the world? I put it like that and I'm like, that's gross. It's meant to be gross. I mean, okay, like I said, who wants to drink out of the toilet? If you don't have fur on your body, you don't usually want to do that. You know what I'm saying? My four-legged friends love that, but you know, as people, we don't really do stuff like that. Who even wants to use a toilet that's nasty and dirty? We wait till we go to our homes where it's clean and honorable. But sometimes as Christians, we don't want to allow God to clean up our lives. We kind of like that crud. So we say, I just won't let God use me. But then we're missing out on what God wants to do in our life. We're missing out on our purpose that God designed us for. It's kind of like having these, these fancy things and sticking them on a shelf until the dust gets that high on them. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been to someone's house that has that happen? Man, I had, I had an aunt, and I think she was maybe borderline porter and stuff, and, and she was a great lady. I loved her to death. She had this one room. I mean, you just, you walked, I remember one time saying, Aunt, aunt Anna, she was getting older, I'm like, I really want that recipe. She goes, well, if you, if you can find it, it's in there. And I walked into this room, and there were magazines on the floor to ceiling and all over the place. I'm like, I'm never finding that thing. <laughs> I'm like, that's not going to happen. But you know, poor Aunt Anna, she was, she was getting older and like, I don't think she dusted the whole 20 years I used to go over to her house when I was a kid. <laughs> and she had, little, she had those little Italian figurines everywhere and stuff, and you know, she was get an Italian lady and stuff. I'm like, wow, but you know, you know, some of those things are kind of cool if you blew the dust off of them. But that's what we are, we're dusty things sitting on the shelves that God can't use. And we're like, well, I just want to sit here with my crown and my dust, and, and God doesn't have to use me, I'll just go to church. God wants to use you. He wants to use each one of us. We all have a purpose. 2 Timothy 4 verses 1 to 8 says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering in the time of my departures at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What he's really saying there, and it speaks not just to Timothy, but it speaks to all of us. He says, God wants you to be ready in season and out of season. He wants you to be ready at all times for him to use you. Because, you know, your being used might not always be as a, son, as a teacher down in kids' church, or might not always be as a life group leader. But him wanting to use you might mean that when you're encountering someone in the store, or encountering your neighbor, or encountering someone at your workplace who comes and they're hurting or something. God might want to use you in that moment, but when he wants to use you, what are those? We stop and we don't want God to use us because maybe our coworkers see all the garbage they hear us cussing every other word at work and we're afraid if I talk about Jesus they'll think I'm a hypocrite. Well, they might. But you know Jesus still, don't you? That's why he says, I want you to be useful for the master. The best way to be useful is by living your life set apart so when the time comes for me to use you, you're ready. You're ready. I can use you. I can pull you off that shelf and use you because you've kept yourself clean, dusted, and free from the crud. I remember, you know, nothing, no one knows how to tell a Christian how to live better than the world. They know what we're supposed to be like. They can tell if we're like that or not. It's always so funny. So I, I always find it funny when someone finds out I'm a preacher and all of a sudden they apologize for cussing and doing this. I'm like, oh, why? I'm like, human being, I'm a person, don't apologize to me. 
He said all that in front of Jesus, apologized to him. If you got a problem with it. But you know, but the world understands what a Christian should be like. I remember being in eighth grade. I never cussed as a kid, never. I remember being in eighth grade. And you know, everybody else in eighth grade cussed in school. And I remember I was in shop class and, and something happened when I cussed. I decided to cuss. Don't you do it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, as soon as I did, I remember Barb. Barb had long hair down to here. I said, I'm a Barb Bear. I mean, there's some people in your life you just remember. Because I remember one day she came, her hair was cut up to here. It was kind of crazy. But Barb, I remember she goes, ah, You cussed! You're supposed to be a Christian! You cussed! You cuss all the time! <laughs> the world knows! Let's keep ourselves pure before God. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not how we become saved, but it's for the effect of our testimony. Hmm. It's not how we become saved. We're saved by His righteousness, but it's for the effect of our testimony. The world doesn't like it when the church is covered in the crust of the world. They want us, they want to still see a pure church. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 16 says, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? You know what? Those who are seeking something real, those who are seeking out God, seeking something real, those people, we are a fragrance of life. Let's not mess up the fragrance. To those who want to rebel against God and His Word, we'll always stink to them. You know what? Count yourself blessed when the world persecutes you. Count yourself blessed when the world doesn't like you because you're standing up, because you're living for Jesus. Not because you're being judgmental towards everybody for Jesus, but because you're living for Jesus. Because that means your life is the aroma of Christ. And they don't like that if they're living in rebellion. But for those who are searching for something real in their hearts, don't mess up the fragrance of Christ by allowing the stench of the world just to linger. You know what I'm saying? You know, you can have body odor, and you can put a gallon of perfume over your body odor, but you can still smell the body odor. Catch what I'm saying there? I remember late, I remember late one time. <laughs> she was an opera singer from France. She was in one of our churches. And, stuff. and, and just, just kind of the culture that she was from, they didn't use deodorant. They didn't use the first spray. You could smell her right off. But on top of it, she put this really strong French perfume, and you could smell that too. One didn't cover the other, you could smell them both. I don't care if you spend $400 on that bottle of French perfume, I can still smell the stuff that you got for free. Thank you. <laughs> Let's be a fresh aroma to the world, Amen. And if you didn't use your antiperspirant, I recommend it over deodorant any day. It does better and it makes you smell good at church. <laughs> Just a little side note there. Third thing, prepare yourself to be used. Prepare your vessel to be used. You know, Paul says at the end of that, he says, flee youthful lusts. Well, you might say, well, I'm old, so I don't have youthful lusts. <laughs> I got news for you. Those youthful lusts can, can chase you all the way through life. You know there's more STDs in nursing homes and in, in, in senior living centers than there are actually amongst teenagers? So it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that, that, that lusts don't follow people in their old age. Okay, maybe TMI, so. <laughs> Flee youthful lusts. We need to flee those desires, those things that burned us, whether it, was, whether it was lust for partying or lust for sexual things or lust for money or lust for violence, whatever it might be. He tells him, he says, flee youthful lusts. Stop feeding the anger. Stop feeding the pride. Stop feeding the desires that your flesh feels. Don't just avoid it. Get away from it. You hear what I'm saying? The word flee, what does that, besides a little tick or something, what does the thought flee come to, come to you when you think of that in your mind? Flee, run! Run the other direction. 
The giant dinosaur is coming at you in the movie and he's going to eat you. Run! <laughs> Flee! Don't just sit there and go, hey, here I am. But you know, a lot of Christians, they toy. They, 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 they look at their lusts and they say, let's dance a little bit. Let's dance. Let's get a little close and stuff like that. I can always resist you. You know, uh-uh. Flee, youthful lusts. Get away from it. If you got a problem with pornography, you shouldn't be going into adult bookstores. You shouldn't be going even into the 7-Eleven. You shouldn't probably have a computer. I've known guys who will not have computers in their house because they're single and they know what it can do to them. If you got a problem with drug use, you don't hang out with your friends who used to do drugs. If you got a problem with drunkenness, you don't go and sit at the bar and hang out and think, I'm just going to have a tonic. You see, we got to flee from those things that, that can draw us back into the old life. we got to run away from those things. If you have a problem with fear, don't go to horror movies. <laughs> Seriously. It feeds fear. If you're stressed out about life, don't watch CNN or Fox. <laughs> I mean... You know, it kind of seems common, but you know, everybody does it, so I'm going to do it too. There are people who really fear what's going to happen tomorrow. They fear life. And then you watch these news shows that are always doomsday in it and putting it down. If you're afraid of the world coming to an end, don't watch Doomsday Survivors. <laughs> those things breed fear in people. I'm not a fearful person. And I look at those things and go, you know, it's like, I don't have to fear. I'm God's in control. He's over my life. Why should I have to fear stuff like that? Flee the things that cause you to sin. Flee the things that trouble you. Flee the things that pull you back and drag you down. Flee from struggles and temptations. Don't try and ride the fence and see if you can do a tightrope balance or something. You're not the flying wonders. And fall on the wrong side. Get as far away from it as you can. Flee youthful lust. And follow, he says. Follow. Read that again. Verse 22 of 2 Timothy 2. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Pursue, follow, pursue the things of God. Pursue righteousness, pursue love, pursue peace. Pursue those who have pure hearts. Pursue friendships with those who have pure hearts. Pursue those things in your life. Why do you think God instituted the church? Do you realize that man did not make church? There are a lot of people out there, they, they read their Bibles, they pray, but they don't go to church. There's a reason for church. Church was not a man-invented thing. It was a God-invented thing. Do you all get that? We, people say, well, um, church is for man. No, it's not. Well, it's for man, but it's not invented by man. But God made church because he knew that we should pursue relationships, connections with other people who are pursuing the same thing, pursuing righteousness, pursuing love, pursuing peace. There are some churches that are pursuing division and fighting and, and hatefulness and judgmentalness, and that's why people run from those churches. But pursue love, peace, righteousness. Pursue those And let the Word of God fill your life. Pursue the Word of God. Pursue prayer. Pursue knowing God. And pursue relationships that are going to build your relationship with God. There are some relationships in our life that we sometimes have to choose to break away from. Do you understand that? If a relationship, if that relationship is, you know, if you put, if you put an ice cube in a pot of boiling water, it will melt. And if you put a cup of boiling water in the freezer, it will freeze. And it will actually freeze faster than if you put a cup of regular water in the freezer. Because, because, if you have more of the bad surrounding you, more of the world surrounding you, it's going to affect your temperature. That's why you need to immerse yourself in the good, in the body of Christ, in the things of God. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. A direct reference to who are we associating with? What are we doing? Because even in the church, we need to use wisdom with whom we partner up with. That's why God says, hey, 
You know, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That doesn't mean that we don't love the unbeliever. That doesn't mean that we never have connection. That doesn't mean that you're unsafe family members that you still don't connect with, that you still don't go to family gatherings. It doesn't mean that you ignore all of your friends. But if that friendship is going to pull you towards the world, then you've got to recognize and say, I need to flee that and pursue or follow good God. If I'm not going to be impacting them for Jesus, or if I can't remain strong and neutral, then I need to watch what I'm doing. Because God wants us to be prepared vessels for his use. He wants us to be vessels of honor. He doesn't want to take us as this beautiful goblet to put his word in that fresh, pure, living water can flow out of. He doesn't want it filled with cobwebs and spiders. I mean, who wants to pour water into a goblet filled with cobwebs and spiders and get all that stuff out when you drink back out of it? He doesn't want you to be sitting by the bedpan when he's called to set you apart and make you holy. The choice becomes ours. Grace is grace. God's forgiveness is God's forgiveness. We're saved by his grace and his righteousness. But God wants to use every one of us as a vessel for his honor. Are we willing to say, here I am, Lord, use me? Here I am, Lord, use me. Would you bow your heads with me?